Alright, what's up everybody? This is Wallace from A3 Academy, and today we're going to be talking about operons. That's some pretty important stuff when it comes to uh, gene regulation, so yeah, let's get started. So first you need to know the definition of an operon, and the definition is a strand of genes under the control of a single promoter. And if that doesn't make sense to you, uh, I will elaborate on it later. But first, let's take a look at a normal strand of DNA, kind of looks like that. And in the strand of DNA, we have these chunks called genes. And genes are the segments of DNA that will eventually get translated into proteins. So as you might know, genes will be transcribed into RNA, and then RNA will become translated into proteins, which will, you know, do lots of cool things around the, the cells and around the body. So in order for the genes to turn into uh, RNA so that the protein synthesis can occur, we have something called RNA polymerase, which is just an enzyme, and it's also called RNAP, and it'll run along the DNA strand, and it will sequentially encode all the genes, and it'll turn it into mRNA. So that's normally what happens with DNA. Pretty much that RNA polymerase binds to the DNA strand and transcribes all the genes into RNA. In an operon, we have two additional segments of DNA that come right before the genes. First, we have the promoter region, which is just a bunch of DNA, and then we have the operator region, which is also a bunch of DNA. So it's all just DNA. But we have these regions, the promoter region, the operator region, and then the genes that will code for proteins later on. And the operator is a pretty important part because there is a protein called the repressor that is always bound to the operator. Or not always, but most of the time is bound to the operator. So in order for the genes to get transcribed into RNA, the RNA polymerase needs to bind to the DNA in the promoter region. But here's the catch. RNA polymerase will not bind to the promoter as long as the repressor is bound to the operator. So in order for the genes to get transcribed, the repressor needs to get out of there somehow. And so there are two types of operons that govern this sort of action. There are the derepressible operons and the co-repressible operons. And so uh, the LAC and TRIP operons are two different uh, operons that have been studied in uh, E. coli, which is just bacteria that lives in your stomach. And the LAC operon is a derepressible operon, and the TRIP operon is co-repressible. And so we will go over how these two types of operons work differently in removing the repressor from the operator. So in the LAC operon, we have the repressor that is bound to the operator so that RNA polymerase will not bind to the promoter region. So a lot of the foods that people eat contain a uh, complex sugar called lactose, and lactose is pretty difficult to break down. So E. coli has this enzyme called lactase, a protein called lactase that will be used to break down lactose. So the genes in the lac operon, uh, they code for lactase, which will break down lactose whenever the E. coli comes across any lactose. So these genes here, uh, they will be turned into mRNA, and then that mRNA will be turned into uh, lactase, which is just what it would use to break down lactose. But remember, RNA polymerase cannot bind to the genes because the repressor is bound to the operator. So no lactase can be created. So how do we get the repressor to be removed from the operator? Well, it turns out that whenever E. coli comes across any sort of lactose, which is just a complex sugar, uh, here we represent it with these little blue circles, uh, these lactose molecules, or to be more exact, uh, isomer of lactose, these molecules have a tendency to bind to the repressor, like this. So the repressor protein has this certain shape that will allow it to bind to the operator. And when this lactose, or the isomer of lactose, I should say, binds to the repressor, the repressor will change its shape. And now it can no longer fit in the operator, so it, the operator is now free, which means that RNA polymerase can now bind to the promoter region and transcribe the genes into mRNA, and that mRNA can be translated into lactase. So now that all this lactase has been produced, lactase, as you know, breaks down lactose molecules. So all these lactose molecules will be broken down, they'll be gone. So now, there's no more lactose to bind to any repressors, which means that a new repressor will come in and bind to the operator, and no more lactase will be created. So this operon is actually pretty ingenious, because 
lactase is only created when there's lactose around to be broken down. So that's why operons, you find them mostly in bacteria, they're really efficient. So when lactose binds to the repressor, the repressor basically is repressed from binding to the operator. So we're repressing the repressor. So we call this derepression. Uh, the lac operon is a derepressible operon. So when the presence of this molecule inhibits the binding of the repressor molecule, that's when we call it derepression. But the trip operon works a bit differently. So in E. coli, uh, another molecule is very vital uh, to the survival of the bacteria. It's called tryptophan. Tryptophan is just an amino acid that's stored in proteins. And you pretty much need it to create all sorts of proteins. So the trip operon has this mechanism for creating tryptophan from these genes here. So these genes, they will code for a certain molecule uh, that is it's called tryptophan. So tryptophan, you usually find it in abundance all around the cell. So normally you'll find that a tryptophan is bound to the repressor. But the repressor on the trip operon is different than the one on the lac operon because the repressor on the trip operon will always stay on the operator as long as tryptophan is bound to it. When tryptophan is bound to the repressor, the repressor stays on the operator. And remember, as long as the repressor is bound to the operator, RNA polymerase cannot bind to the promoter, which means that no more tryptophan will be created. And that makes sense, because when there's lots of tryptophan around, you don't need to make more of it. But when there's a shortage of tryptophan, we need to make more tryptophan. So the there is no more tryptophan to bind to the repressor, and the repressor will change its shape when there's no tryptophan bound to it. And since the repressor has changed its shape, it can no longer bind to the operator on the trip operon, which allows RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and transcribe the genes to create more tryptophan. So now that there's all this tryptophan, if, say, another repressor molecule comes, tryptophan will immediately bind to the repressor, the repressor will change its shape, and it will be able to bind to the operator again, which will no longer allow RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and create more tryptophan. So, again, this is actually a really efficient method for keeping tryptophan levels in check because it will only create more tryptophan if there's a shortage of tryptophan in the cell. Now, the presence of tryptophan, when there's tryptophan bound to the repressor, the repressor will stay on the operator, which means that the trip operon is what we call a co-repressible operon. So, this method is called co-repression, when tryptophan binds to the repressor and the repressor binds to the operator. So now that you know these two different types of operons, derepressible and co-repressible, uh, that's all you pretty much have to know about operons. Uh, that's all for today. I'm Wallace from A3 Academy. Hope you learned something from this informative podcast. And as always, the more you know, the better you are.